everybody. Welcome to Collider Mailbag, the all-mailbag show here on Collider Video, where apparently all we do is take your mailbag questions. My name is John Campia. I am the senior producer over here at Collider Video. And happy Thanksgiving weekend to everybody. I hope y'all had a great uh, Thanksgiving weekend filled with friends and family and food and hopefully not too much Black Friday shopping. Um, uh, for those of you who don't know, uh, Mailbag is kind of more laid back, relaxed version of, uh, of movie talk that we do here on the weekends on Saturdays and Sundays. And for those of you who watch uh, movie talk and Mailbag and stuff like that, you might notice I made a mistake. My, I shaved. I shaved. Uh, I've been doing No Shave November as I have in years past to help raise awareness for cancer and to uh, remind people to make donations to cancer research and things like that. And we had a big family thing coming up on the weekend and I wasn't going to shave. And then, you know, and it was starting to drive me crazy. And I know it was driving a lot of you crazy because I look so ridiculous. And um, so somebody said to me, well, you know, this was after like a Wednesday show. They said, John, you got no more shows between now and the end of the month and you've got your family thing coming up. But since you got no more shows, why don't you shave now? Because your on air things done. It's not going to do any more good um, to remind people because your shows are done. And I said, ah, yes, thank goodness. And I shaved it. And then I remembered I still had mailbags to do. So um, I'm an idiot, but that was already well established. No surprises there. No surprises. But uh, so, but we just confirmed I'm an idiot. I totally forgot about that. And so uh, I shaved. But I hope by this point in the month, you guys have made your donations to Cancer Research anyway. And uh, next year, I will not forget. And I will, I will hold, even if I have no more shows to do, I will hold fast to the November 30th date. I feel kind of dumb that I forgot about this. But anyway, I did. So there you go. Um, so with all that out of the way, we do mailbag questions here. So how do you get your question on our show? It's really Really simple. You just email us at collidervideo at gmail.com. Once again, that's collidervideo at gmail.com. Send on your questions and we take a mailbag question or two every day, Monday through Friday on uh, Movie Talk. And then we take a whole bunch of them here on the weekends on Mailbag. So with that out of the way, let's get to the first question. And the first question today comes to us from uh, Shabazz Ansari, who writes, Hi guys, I'm from India. Well, thanks for watching us all the way in India. I'm watching your show uh, for the last six months, and it's the best movie talk show. Well, thank you very much. My question is, uh, is there any news about a, the new Christopher Nolan project? Because this new movie will be releasing in 2017, and we know nothing about it. If you guys know something, please tell us. Thanks for all your great work. Well, thanks a lot for the question, Shabazz. And yeah, there are very few filmmakers out there that can have the following and have people buzzing, what's the this director's next movie going to be? I mean, because normally you, you don't hear that buzz about directors. I mean, maybe J.J. Abrams has that kind of buzz with them. Um, and maybe a Spielberg, maybe a Scorsese. But really, for, because they've been so remarkable, especially in the last 10 years, Christopher Nolan's films are films that everybody gets excited about. It's like, what's his next project? Now, we do know that Warner Brothers, his, his next few movies actually will be with Warner Brothers. And we do know that it's actually been announced for July 21st, 2017. What's the movie going to be? They're not saying a word about it. However, there is some speculation. Now, remember, this is just speculation. Don't go to the bank with this. There's some speculation going around right now that about what his movie might be. And well, there's several pieces of speculation, but there's one in particular that I personally subscribe to, all right? And the theory is this. Christopher Nolan is going to direct Akira. Now that, remember, that's just a theory. That's just speculation that's going around, but it is a theory that I personally buy into. Now, let's think, look at it this way. Christopher Nolan loves doing his original films, but he's also obviously done... Um, work and films based on previous work. I mean, he did Batman Begins, The Dark Knight, The Dark Knight uh, Rises, all that kind of stuff. So clearly he's comfortable doing pre-existing IP. We know that. We also know that his last movie didn't do as well, uh, um, Interstellar, didn't do as well 
as they were hoping, still made like om- like north of six hundred and fifty million dollars. I think in the six hundred and seventy million dollar range, right up there. That's a that's a smash hit by n- no matter what measure you try to apply to it. But I mean, it's not the seven to eight hundred million that they were projecting. I also think it wasn't one of his stronger outings. I, I like the film. I like it very much, but it it wasn't on that Nolan level for me. So coming out of that, you could understand him feeling or the studio feeling like we want another bona fide billion dollar blockbuster. Okay. Warner Brothers is also developing Akira. Akira that at one point, Christopher Nolan's brother Jonathan was going to be working on the script. And here's the other thing. They're putting it on July 21st. Now, by putting it on July 21st, that is prime summer blockbuster season. That's putting this new Christopher Nolan film in the same neighborhood, roughly, as the new Spider-Man, standalone Spider-Man movie that's coming and the new Pirates of the Caribbean movie. Now, whatever you think about the Pirates of the Caribbean movies, one thing you can't deny, they are box office juggernauts. Okay, the Pirates of the Caribbean movies, regardless of what you think of them, they make bank to a ridiculous degree, no matter how good or how bad they are. So you're releasing this new Christopher Nolan movie right in the middle of that. It would seem reasonable that by dropping this new movie right in prime summer blockbuster real estate space, that it might be on an existing IP. It might be on an existing brand name that people would recognize, that fans would get excited about, not just on Christopher Nolan's name alone, but a recognizable IP combined with Christopher Nolan's name that Warner Brothers would feel comfortable. We can drop this movie right here in the middle of the summer season in the same neighborhood as Spider-Man, Pirates of the Caribbean, a bunch of other big films that are coming out, and we are confident it will do amazing business. You start to have a limited number of films that you could be talking about, and I think Akira is one of them. Now, here's the other thing. The secrecy right now. This movie is just a year and a half away. Whatever this Christopher Nolan movie is, it's only a year and a half away. The secrecy surrounding that, that they're not saying anything about it, leads me to believe it's not a Christopher Nolan original. Now, I could be wrong about that. Totally could be wrong about that. But it seems to me you could just say, why not just say, uh, we're not going to give any details, but it's a new script, it's a new film by Christopher Nolan uh, based on an original story of his. You could have just said that. I mean, they basically did do that for Interstellar. They told us nothing about it, but it's it's a it's based on an original story. They're moving forward with it. It's going to be an original film. By keeping it secret, by not saying anything about this new project at all, that kind of leads me to suspect that that means it's going to be a title we recognize, and they're keeping it under wraps. So look, I do believe that the new film will be Akira. I think that's the film Christopher Nolan's going to do. But I'm not certain about that. This is all speculation. It's pure speculation. It, it just feels like the, the dominoes are lined up, though, to fall in that direction for all the reasons that we mentioned. Um, so maybe it's another recognizable IP, or maybe it's a totally original Christopher Nolan film. I don't know. But I'm just saying, if I had to put money on it right now, and I'm so glad I do not have to put money on it, but if I did have to put money on it right now, I would probably bet on Nolan's new film, number one, being an existing property, and number two, that that specific property would probably be Akira. I'm curious to know, what are your theories? Is Do you think he's going to do another pure original film? Do you think he's going to do an existing IP, but something other than Akira? Or do you think he, do you agree with me that it's probably going to be Akira? Let me know your thoughts in the comments section below, and thanks a lot for the question. All right, let's move on to question number two. And question number two today comes from Setgang6, who writes, What are the odds Fox made a deal with Marvel to trade Fantastic Four, Silver Surfer, and Villains of the X-Men, TV rights, and possibly merchandising licenses? Keep it filthy. Well, thanks a lot for the question. We've been getting a lot of questions lately about, you know, the possibilities. I mean, after Fantastic Four over at Fox completely just bombed both financially and critically. A lot of people have been speculating, understandably so, have been speculating about about the possibilities of Fox 
and Marvel making a deal where Marvel can get Fantastic Four back. And you've heard us talk about this. And, it, you know, what I've said before, and I, and I still agree with this, is I don't know that Fantastic Four is a valuable commodity. Like, look, there was a long time before Sony started getting in all their financial troubles. There was a long time before Sony was getting in trouble that, you know, I said, I don't know why Marvel would make a play for Spider-Man because Marvel films are doing just great, like fantastic without Spider-Man. I don't see why Marvel would give up something big like $3 billion or give up something big and major in order to get Spider-Man when they're doing just fine without Spider-Man. Um, now, my, my tune changed a little bit once all the news came out about how you know bad, like in the six months or so leading up to Marvel and Spider-Man signing their deal, I changed my tune a bit. I was like, well, Sony's now in financial trouble, so maybe Sony's in a position where they need to make a deal. But it still seemed to me odd that Marvel would give up anything big or significant to get Spider-Man because they didn't really need him. I mean, he would have been nice to have, and he's a really valuable property. He's a very valuable IP. So, and still an incredibly valuable franchise, even though, you know, the last Spider-Man movie was a botch. The one before that was great. The one before that was a botch, but the two before that were great. So it was still a really super valuable property. So even though I, I couldn't understand why Marvel would give up anything really valuable or a lot of money to get Spider-Man in, you can understand why it'd be nice. But I just couldn't see how it made a lot of sense for Marvel. But for Sony, it was starting to make sense. With Fantastic Four, and of course, then they made a deal and Marvel didn't give up anything. Um, they didn't exact. Marvel still doesn't have Spider-Man. They have the rights to use Spider-Man, but they don't have him. S Spider-Man still belongs to Sony and all that kind of stuff. So ultimately, Marvel and Kevin Feige, uh, Perlmutter was involved with it at the time, and the higher-ups at Disney, they pulled off a brilliant move where they were able to get Spider-Man in without giving anything up. They just, uh, I mean, Sony was still going to make Spider-Man movies anyway. So now Spider, now Sony gets to use some of Marvel's characters in their thing. Marvel gets to use Spider-Man in their movies. Everybody won. Um, well, I mean, everybody finishes ahead. No, there was no clear winner per se, but everybody finished ahead. With Fantastic Four, it's a bit of a different scenario in that not only does Marvel not need Fantastic Four, but Fantastic Four right now, unlike Spider-Man, who was still a really valuable property, a really valuable IP that could bring something to the table, Fantastic Four is not. I mean, Fantastic Four has now had three, if you want to count the Corman thing, four, but we'll just say three, three bad, terrible films in a row culminating in an all-time Hollywood legendary disaster, both on screen and behind the cameras. The, the Fantastic Four name right now is mud. Nobody reads the comic book Fantastic Four, even before they canceled it. No, the reason they canceled it is because nobody read it. Like, nobody read it. Um, it's, it's a recognizable name, but it had no value. There was no value to it. Now, some readers and viewers of Collider Movie Talk and Collider Video made brought up a really good point to me because I was saying, look, there's no value to the Fantastic Four name. There's no value to it. And then some viewers pointed out to me a very good point about something that I was missing. And that's the fact that, well, John, maybe the value of Fantastic Four isn't with the Fantastic Four themselves, but there's still value with their rogues gallery, with their bad guys, with Galactus, with Silver Surfer, with a lot of the other names that may come along with them, maybe there's value in that. And to that, I had to go, hmm, you know what? You're right. You're right. There is value in the Fantastic Four IP just for the sake of, value. you know, Doctor Doom, Galactus. So all those guys, there could be value there. But it's still a situation where I don't know that Marvel would actually be willing to give up anything because here's the thing. Fox has botched. Now, this is just my perception. This is my speculation and my perception of it, okay? This is not based on any fact. Just should be clear about that. But it would seem to me, if I'm Marvel right now, if I'm Disney, if I'm Kevin Feige or I'm Bob Iger or, or whoever, I'm thinking, why would I want to give up anything? I'm in the ultimate position of power right now. Fox has botched Fantastic Four so badly 
I just don't believe they're going to take another swing at Fantastic Four. I believe if I'm Marvel and I want Fantastic Four IP and I want that property back because I want all those villains that I can now use in the MCU, I'm thinking, I bet I don't have to give anything up. I bet I can just sit back and wait. Just wait for Fox's contract to run out. Like, Because remember, Fox has this contract, this licensing agreement for Fantastic Four, that the only way they get to keep Fantastic Four is if they keep making Fantastic Four movies within a certain period of time. And as long as they're making Fantastic Four movies, they get to keep Fantastic Four. But I'm thinking right now, if I'm Marvel, I'm like, I don't have to give Fox anything. I don't have to give them a single thing. If I want Fantastic Four back, and I'm not even really sure they want Fantastic Four back, but if I'm Marvel and I want Fantastic Four back, I am sitting back, crossing my arms, and Fox says to me, how about we give you Fantastic Four back for a billion dollars? And I go, nope. Okay, then uh, three weeks later, okay, how about we give you Fantastic Four back for $200 million? Nope. Okay, how about we give you Fantastic Four back for the TV rights to this? No, I mean, maybe there are deals there to be made that make sense for Marvel, but I'm thinking if Marvel just wants Fantastic Four back, all they got to do is wait. They just got to wait. I have to believe that there are people over at Fox smart enough to realize that enough's enough. They've had three kicks at the can at making Fantastic Four something good and valuable and something people want to see, and they have failed three times. Three strikes, you're out. I've got to... And now... now the Fantastic Four name is mud. The Fantastic Four name is mud now because of the way they botched it. So I've got to believe that there are people at Fox who are smart enough to know enough's enough. Let's just cut our losses, cut it loose, and then Marvel can just get it back. I mean, like I said, that's just me. That's just how I would handle if I was Marvel. Give me your thoughts in the comments section. Let's see how this is all going to turn out. All right, let's move on to the next question. And the next question today comes to us from Jeremy. And Jeremy writes... Do you think they will release Civil War trailers that align with the Iron Man ideology? The first badass trailer seemed to lean heavily towards the Captain America camp. It is his movie, after all. I just think it would be cool if they were to try and divide the audience, making the consequences hit home a lot harder. What are your thoughts? Um, well, here's the thing. Of course, this past week, the trailer for Captain America Civil War dropped, and it was fantastic. Great trailer. Um, and, and so basically what you're asking is you're insinuating that this trailer showed it all from Captain America's point of view. Should they put out one that's more from Iron Man's point of view? My reaction to that would be I kind of felt like they did show it from Captain America's point of view and Iron Man's point of view. I mean, you had, you know, you had General Thunderbolt Ross. Look, there are a lot of people look at you as a vigilante. You have Tony Stark in the trailer saying, look, we can't just act with impunity. That makes us no better than the bad guys. You know, they were showing the other point of view to which Captain America said, well, I disagree. So I felt that as far as ideologies go, I felt like this trailer actually did a pretty good job showing both ideologies. Now, obviously the trailer was Captain America heavy over Iron Man, but that's to be expected because this is Captain America's movie. It is Captain America Civil War. So it was more heavy towards Captain America. I believe every trailer is going to be more heavy towards Captain America, but I also feel like this trailer did a fairly good job of, to a degree showing both sides <clears throat> it's showing both sides of the argument and so with that in mind I, so I don't know that we're going to get a Tony Stark ideology centric trailer because I kind of felt like the first one was pretty balanced just my opinion jump in the comments section and let me know what you guys think all right let's move on to the next question and the next question today comes to us from Calum Foster who writes Hey, Collider, big fan. I just wanted to know, when the Flash and Arrow crossover happens, will the recap show hosts come together, or will it be staying the same? Just a fun idea. Thanks for your time and keep up the great work. Yeah, so uh, a couple times a year, the, the Flash TV show and the Arrow TV show, they do a crossover episodes where... Uh, part one happens on The Flash on Tuesday nights, and then part two happens on Arrow on Wednesday nights. And they make it a crossover. It's a really great idea. They started it last year with uh, Flash season one. So we 
uh, here on Clyde to Video, we do a recap show for both The Flash on Tuesday nights and we do a recap show for Arrow on Wednesday nights. And um, the question is, are we going to cross over the recap show hosts? And the answer to that is yes, sort of. So this coming Tuesday, um, I will, of course, be hosting the Flash recap show. And we're going to get one or two people from the Arrow recap show to come over and join us. And then on Wednesday night, I, for the first time in a long time, will go over and I will be on an Arrow recap show. And I'm going to bring one other pr person probably from the, uh, from the Flash recap show team with me over to do the Arrow recap show. So, yes, it won't be like eight people at the table, but one or two people will come over from the Arrow show and one or two people will come over from the Flash show. And we will have a crossover recap show. So keep your eyes open for that. Of course, that is on Tuesday night. So we hope you guys join us for that. All right, let's move on to the next question. And the next question today comes to us from Gail McGowan, who writes, Hi, guys. Now that The Good Dinosaur has been released, it'd be interesting to know how you would how you would rank the animated films that have been released so far from best to worst. Inside Out, Good Dinosaur, Peanuts, Movie Shaun, Shaun the Sheep, Home, um, uh, the SpongeBob movie, Hotel Transylvania, Strange Magic. Hopefully I haven't forgotten any. Uh, thanks for sharing your opinion. Well, thanks a lot for the question. Yeah, it's it's been a busy year for animated films this year. There have been some really good ones. Um, so I will give you Instead of from best to worst, I will give you my list of worst to best uh, animated films this year. And just let me just look up something uh, up here. Do, 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 do. Just make sure I'm not forgetting anything right now. Right. Okay. So um, here are my movies, worst to best. Worst animated movie this year. We'll start with, we're, there's going to be several categories. First, the distinctively bad animated films. Okay. So the bad animated films are, and the worst of all, is Home. I thought that movie was just atrocious. Next would be uh, Strange Magic, which no, George Lucas did not direct. He did the story, but, but a lot of people think George Lucas directed Strange Magic. He did not, but he's, he did provide the story for it. But a bad, bad film. Also falling under the category of bad, the third worst animated film of the year to me is Hotel Transylvania 2. Now, don't get me wrong. Hotel Transylvania 2 had some redeeming qualities. It did. It had a couple of laughs. Um, not a train wreck of a movie. Not at all. Um, but it would, uh, yeah, that would be next. So, so far, going from worst to best, Home, Strange Magic, Hotel Transylvania 2. And then I will get into a couple of films that I'll say were okay. Okay animated films. And the first one would be Minions. Minions is a disappointment. It was okay at best. Um, and I love Minions. I know a lot of you guys love Minions. Uh, the creatures uh, that were in Despicable Me 1 and 2. But as a standalone film, to me, it just it didn't have that magic. To me, the Minions work best as supporting characters. Um, I was very excited to see what they would do in a standalone movie. It's certainly been very financially successful. But uh, it was an okay movie at best. Right above Minions, I would say the SpongeBob movie. I I hate I don't get the appeal of SpongeBob, but I gotta admit there 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 was some decent stuff in the SpongeBob uh, movie. Um, uh, something out of water, whatever the name of the this one was. So where I go for more best so far: Home, Strange Magic, Hotel Transylvania 2, Minions, the SpongeBob movie. Now we get into some good animated films. Okay, now we get into some good ones. And the first one I will mention is Shaun the Sheep. Almost no dialogue whatsoever in this movie, and yet I was entertained. It was very cute, very nice film. I enjoyed watching it. Right above Shaun the Sheep, the new one that just opened, Pixar's The Good Dinosaur. Will not go down as one of the classic uh, Pixar films, but a very enjoyable movie. I smiled from start to finish. I really had a good time watching it. Didn't have that depth of story that we're used to seeing in a lot of the Pixar films, but very cute, very charming, very enjoyable film. I laughed, I giggled, I smiled, I felt good. You know, one of those films. So in the good category this year, I will put um, Shaun the Sheep and right above it, The Good Dinosaur. 
Now we get into the top two, which I will call exceptional animated films this year. And the first one I'm going to mention is the Peanuts movie. I was apprehensive about a Charlie Brown Peanuts movie when they first announced it. I thought like it was just kind of capitalizing on anniversary and, you know, all that kind of stuff. I enjoyed the trailers, but I still wasn't expecting much. I loved the Peanuts movie. Loved, loved, loved the Peanuts movie. I think I tweeted and Facebooked when I came out of watching it that uh, the Charlie Brown movie makes my heart happy. And it does. It's all the things that the good dinosaur was only a little bit better. And, and it had a little bit more of a message to it. And when, by the end of the film, when Charlie Brown is talking to the redhead girl, I'm not going to give spoilers away what, what is said and all that kind of stuff, but I almost, I felt, I felt tears welling up a little bit. Didn't cry. I felt tears. I felt so good. Like life craps on Charlie Brown so much. And, and it just felt so good at the end. I just enjoyed that movie so, so much. Um, so I, so far, once again, I'm labeling them from worst to best home, strange magic, uh, hotel Transylvania two minions, uh, SpongeBob, Sean, the sheep, uh, the good dinosaur, the peanuts movie, and the best of the best this year to me still might be, I'm not sure anymore, but it might still end up being my favorite film of 2015 animated or not is inside out. I just thought that was a brilliantly put together film brilliantly made movie um, with with a lot in it that you have to go back and see it two or three times to see how much incredible stuff you missed. Uh, so to me, easily head and shoulders, the best animated film of the year is um, is Inside Out. But, you know, full marks to the Peanuts movie. Really good time. Uh, go out, watch a good dinosaur. You have a good time. If you didn't see Shaun the Sheep, get out and see Shaun the Sheep as well. So some really good animated offerings this year. All right, let's move on to the next question. And the next question today comes to us from Jonathan Conway, who writes, With the X-Men Apocalypse trailer imminent, and considering how epic and impactful recent trailers are, like Batman vs. Superman, Civil War, The Force Awakens, etc., and with the perception people seem to have about Apocalypse's look, in the next in the next X-Men film, do you think Singer and company will put together a, Hey, everyone, what were you saying? kind of huge tease trailer, basically shutting everyone up about their doubts about the film. Well, thanks a lot for the question. And for those of you who don't know what Jonathan's talking about, um, as you can see in, in, in the uh, corner right here, uh, Apocalypse looks bad. It's not a good look for Apocalypse. That's not a good looking Apocalypse. Now, I'm one of these guys who I don't think you have to make the guys, the comic book characters in movies look just like the way they look in the comic books. I'm totally for taking liberties to make, because what do I always say? The first responsibility of a filmmaker is not to be as faithful to the original material as possible. Their first responsibility is make the best movie possible. And if that means you got to take some liberties with how Apocalypse looks, then take liberties. But I, I don't like the look of, well, I keep, there he is. I don't like the look of this Apocalypse, and a lot of people didn't. And there are some you know, people out there comparing him to the Power Rangers Ivan Ooze, fairly so, because there are comparisons to be made there. But when you say, do, do you think Brian Singer and company and Fox will put out an X-Men Apocalypse trailer that'll make everybody shut up about their doubts about the movie? Well, you're making a wild assumption there. There are people like me who think this apocalypse looks dumb. But just because I think the apocalypse looks dumb doesn't mean I don't think he's going to be a great character. Just because I don't like the look of, of the of the character at this point doesn't mean I don't think the movie isn't going to be amazing. I think, from what I've read at any rate, the vast majority of people out there, even the ones who think and who were complaining about the look of Apocalypse, most of them still think this movie is going to be amazing and that the character will be amazing. Yeah, it would have been nice if Apocalypse looked better, but that's not how he looks is not going to determine whether this is a good movie or not. So yes, I'm not happy with the way Apocalypse looks, but I'm fully expecting a great movie. And I'm also fully expecting a great trailer because, you know, X-Men Days of Future Past trailers were awesome. I mean, and look at um, uh, Quicksilver, right? Look at Quicksilver from X-Men Days of Future Past. Did he look great? No. I mean, I, 
once I kind of figured and put him in the 70s context, his look made more sense to me even before I saw the movie. I thought, okay, no, 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 his look doesn't bother me. But it still wasn't a great look. But that didn't stop Quicksilver from being one of the best characters in the movie. He almost stole that movie just in the couple of scenes he had. So just because the character doesn't look great or look the way we want him to look or all that kind of stuff doesn't mean, and I think most of us, you and I, are smart enough to know that just because the character doesn't look the way we want him to look, that doesn't mean he's not going to be a great character. I fully expect, even though I'm disappointed with the look, that Apocalypse in Brian Singer's hands will be an awesome character, and I believe the movie will be awesome. But yes, the trailer they put out in the, in the next couple of weeks is going to blow everybody away. I have full confidence in that. All right, let's move on to the next question. And the next question today comes to us from James Fung, who writes, Hey, Collider guys, been watching you guys regularly and wanted to get further thoughts from you regarding Tom Cruise being in a comic book universe. He was once up for Iron Man. Where could he fit today within Marvel or DC? What if Marvel got him for the role of Matthew McConaughey passed on for Guardians 2? Maybe Star-Lord's dad? Well, thanks a lot for the question, James. And yeah, a lot of people forget <clears throat> that long before... Um, Robert Downey Jr. came out. Actually, even before John Favreau was attached to direct the first Iron Man, Kevin Feige and Tom Cruise were had worked it out that Tom Cruise was going to be Iron Man. Now, it was never signed, but it was established. Tom Cruise is going to be Iron Man. And he was attached for a long time while they were putting everything together. Now, at some point, and I can't remember the, the story exactly, but at some point it had taken long enough and as it was coming together more and more, Tom Cruise looked at it and eventually said, I don't think this is going to work for me and I don't think I'm the best fit for it and I don't think it's the best fit for me and eventually he walked away. Now then Favreau came on, Favreau fought, wanted Robert Downey Jr. and the rest is history. But yeah, Tom Cruise was going to be our Iron Man. I think he would have been a great Iron Man, I really do. Um, but I'm really thankful that we ended up with uh, Robert Downey Jr. playing it at the same time. Now, all that being said, it seems like everybody wants to talk about any actor today. Who could they be in a comic book movie? Okay, well, let's play that game a little bit with Tom Cruise. Um, the problem we face with Tom Cruise is that while he is still kicking ass... He is 52, 53, somewhere, somewhere in that neighborhood. It is a difficult age to start um, to introduce him into a comic book universe, particularly as a hero. So I think that's out the window. He's just at an age now that he can't be your hero for the next seven or eight years. You can't build a franchise around him with an existing hero right now. That being said... Well, then what about what you're saying? The role that Matthew McConaughey passed on. The one that's going to be, you know, Star-Lord's dad. That a lot of us are speculating right now. At least, uh, you know, Heroic Hollywood is reporting that it's going to be Captain Marvel, Marvel. The There's a physical problem with that. Um, Chris Pratt is like 6'4". Uh, Matthew McConaughey is like 6... I think 6'2", 6'3". You know what? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to look that up. Um... How tall is Matthew uh, McConaughey? Mac Matthew McConaughey is listed as being uh, is six feet. I think Chris Pratt is six four. Now I'm going to write that in. I got to look that up. How tall is uh, Chris Pratt? Chris Pratt. I was guessing six four. He's actually six two. Chris Pratt is six two. McConaughey is six feet tall. Um, so McConaughey could have been. Pratt's dad at 6'2". Tom Cruise is 5'7", and I think 5'7 is being generous. I actually think he's listed officially as 5'7". I think he's 5'6". Um, now, he's a lot shorter than me. Chris Pratt is a lot taller than me. I, so, I mean, who's to say how alien genetics work? But, I mean, it would seem odd to get an actor like Tom Cruise and pass him off as Chris Pratt's father when Chris Pratt is like nearly half a foot taller than Tom Cruise. So I don't know. So look, if you were going to use, all that being said, his age, the physical nature of him, um, he is a kick-ass action star. So I think if you're going to use him in a Marvel Cinematic Universe or even in DC, I think at this point you use him as a villain, as a one-shot villain, maybe two films that you could use. Now, who could that villain be? I don't know. Pick one out of a hat. It doesn't matter. 
Um, but I think if you ever saw Tom Cruise playing in a um, in a comic book movie, I think we're looking at him playing decidedly, probably playing a villain. All right, last question of the day. And the final question today comes to us from Ethan Middleton, who writes, Hey, Collider crew, loving the show. Well, thank you so much. I remember when Jonathan Lithgow talked about him recording some of his voice work again for The Good Dinosaur. When I saw it, I didn't hear his voice at all. I even looked up the cast and crew on IMDb and couldn't find anything. What happened? Well, it sounds like a question for John Schnepp. What happened? Okay, so The Good Dinosaur which I just talked about, delightful movie. I really enjoyed it. I think you will too. Um, It is probably by far the biggest drama that Pixar has ever had. Now, they first announced The Good Dinosaur back in 2011. And it was originally slated to come out, I believe, in May of 2014. Um, So it, it had a lot going wrong with it because... Not only did it start going through massive changes, but then the director, Bob Peterson, it got announced that he was removed from the film. Now, he's still with Pixar, and apparently the relationship between Bob Peterson and Pixar is still very, very good, but they pulled him off it. They almost redid the entire film. Like Jonathan Lithgow mentioned in in an interview with Collider.com, by the way, that You know, hey, I had already done all my voice work, but I got to go back because we've practically changed the whole film. I got to go back and reshoot it. Well, apparently they even changed the voices because they got rid of Jonathan Lithgow. So Jonathan Lithgow isn't even in the film. This is a movie that went through wholesale changes. They almost started again from scratch and hence it got pushed all the way back to summer of 2015. There was a time they even thought they were going to push it to 2016, but they got out in 2015. And the end result was a really nice little film. But like I said, it was it was almost a wholesale change. So that's why you didn't hear Jonathan Lithgow. And the end result is a good film. They ended up with a really nice little film. But it went through a lot of drama uh, to get to this point. And uh, losing Jonathan Lithgow was one. I have a feeling he was probably going to play Arlo's dad. That's my guess. Oh, you know what? I bet, I don't know this for sure. Uh, I'm speculating. I bet he was going to play the one that Sam Shepard uh, ultimately voiced, the the uh, the big Tyrannosaurus Rex. I bet. I don't know who he was going to play. I'm just speculating. All right. Well, guys, that will do it for us for this installment of Collider Mailbag. Thank you so much for joining us. Don't forget to come back and join us again tomorrow for our Sunday edition. Uh, again, I hope you all had a wonderful Thanksgiving holiday. I hope you're still enjoying your Thanksgiving holiday. I uh, the offices and everything here at, at the Collider Studios are empty. I'm the only one here today. Um, but uh, I want to wish you and yours a, a fun, relaxing, enjoyable time with friends and family for the rest of this week. And listen, don't forget, I mentioned Collider.com. If you're a fan of entertainment, make sure you bookmark Collider.com. The team over there does a crack job of keeping you up to date by the minute. Of all things entertainment, television, films related, make sure you bookmark Collider.com. And hey, while you're at it, Make sure you subscribe to this YouTube channel, our Collider Video YouTube channel here, keeping you up to date on everything going on um, with all of our shows, all the videos that we create. Make sure you follow us. And do me a favor, click the thumbs up button to let us know that you like it. Leave a comment in the comment section below on any or all the topics that you agree or disagree with. I cannot wait to hear your opinions. So that'll do it for us, guys, for this installment of Collider Mailbag. My name's John Campia. You can follow me on Facebook and Twitter, simply at John Campia. Make sure you follow me there. I make a lot of Collider video announcements first on my social media, so make sure you're following me there. That'll do for me, guys. So until tomorrow, bye-bye.